Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so on, at the outset of the strategic research initiative, fast forward to tomorrow's cures, the need for an epigenomics core was identified as a key enabler of the plan. Following a survey of our faculty, a small working group, and a business case proposal, the Dean of the Medical School committed funds to launch an epigenomics core within the Biomedical Research Core facilities, creating another asset in our toolbox for researchers to ultimately impact patient lives. Under the direction and guidance of Dr. Figueroa, the medical school was able to launch an epigenomics core within just a few brief months. Dr. Figueroa was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 1972. She received her MD from Universidad... What? <laughs> She just turned 21 last week. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> she received her MD from Universidad del Salvador, the School of Medicine in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 1990 something. <laughs> After completing her internal medicine residency, she went in or she went on to train at, as a hematologist hematologist at the Institute for Hematological Research, Mariano Castex, from the National Academy of Medicine in Buenos Aires, where she later joined the malignant hematology department. In 2004, Dr. Figueroa joined Dr. Ari Melnick's laboratory at the Einstein, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and later at Will Cornell Medical College. During her postdoctoral training with Dr. Melnick, Dr. Figueroa's research focused on the characterization of epigenetic deregulation and myeloid malignancies, particularly acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndromes. She has been the recipient of scholar awards from the SAS Foundation for Cancer Research, the American Society of Hematology, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, as well as being the recipient of a University of Michigan Biological Sciences Scholar Award. Dr. Figueroa joined the Department of Pathology at the University of Michigan Medical School in June 2011 as assistant professor, where she continues her work in the field of epigenetic regulation of normal and malignant hematopoiesis. Please join me in welcoming the young and beautiful Dr. Figueroa. <laughs> that was a typo, it was 82. Um. <laughs> Okay, so um, here we have about an hour allocated. By, I did not prepare a one hour talk because I want this to be open to as many questions. I know from emails and visits to my office from different people that there are many questions about what we do and what our capabilities are. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just coming out of a cold. Um, and it would not be possible to comprehensively cover absolutely every everything. So what I wanted to do is give really just a brief primer into epigenetic regulation and what uh, epigenetics does and what's known about epigenetic deregulation in different diseases out there, and then walk you through what we can do and how we can help you, hopefully uh, help you in your research. So <clears throat> with that, oh, excuse me. So. I don't think I really need to go after, you know, probably 10 or 15 years of epigenetics research. I don't really need to convince people that um, gene transcription is not dependent solely on the um, DNA sequence and what we know and we've known for many years as, the years as the genetic regulation, but it's also dependent on epigenetic regulation that at its most simplistic uh, level, we can talk about DNA methylation and histone modifications, but we'll also talk about microRNAs and other forms of uh, epigenetic regulations. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll focus mainly on these two aspects of epigenetic regulation. So epigenetic regulation, just as genetic, re or epigenetic information, just as epigenetic information uh, is, oh, sorry. My slides are out of order, but anyway. Epigenetic regulation is called that because it actually sits on top of the genetic regulation. That's what epi means. So it's a higher level of regulation on what we already have, which is the DNA sequence. And just as genetic information, it is necessary for life, and it is transmitted from mother cell to daughter cell through transgenerational divisions. So this is a key form of biological information that is contained in the cells 
and that is transferred. And just like genetic regulation or genetic information can be disrupted in different forms of disease or as a response to changes in the environment, so can epigenetic regulation. And in fact, we could argue that's even more sensitive to those things since it's the first form of changes that will occur upon external stimuli. <clears throat> Unlike genetic information that is encoded on a simple four-base system, epigenetic regulation is actually a lot more complex, and the components of the epigenetic machinery are really in the hundreds of proteins involved in writing, reading, and erasing the information. It's also encoded in the histone modifications and DNA modifications, particularly cytosine modifications in mammalian cells, but other organisms may have other forms of uh, methylation. So, as I said, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus mainly on cytosine modifications and, you know what, I can't really see. Can you hear me if I stand here? Okay, thank you, because I can't really see the, the slide. So, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to talk mainly about cytosine modifications and histone modifications. Both of these forms of covalent um, modifications to the chromatin are, are, uh, are there to help make the chromatin either more accessible or the genes in the chromatin more accessible or less accessible. As you all know, all the cells have just one genome. We'll have the same genetic contact in all the cells. But if we want to make a specialized cell, we only need to use part of that genetic information. That's what epigenetic information is there for. It makes chromatin from highly compact to highly open. And we do this through different modifications. Cytosine modifications, for many, many, many years, we've talked about DNA methylation. And we've known that DNA methylation can lead to the repression, the repression of genes that when they become hypermethylated, they become silenced through compaction of the uh, chromatin. However, in more recent years, we've learned that cytosine, cytosine methylation is not the only modification. We also have hydroxymethylation, we have formyl methylation, and carboxyl methylation. These other methylation, uh, cytosine modifications were initially thought to be only intermediate steps in the demethylation process. But I'm going to show you later that that is not necessarily the case and that they actually play a biological role. At the histone levels, we have a histone core, as you all know, made up of four uh, dimers of the H, H1, H2, A, A, oh God, I'm so tongue twisted. <laughs> The, you have the histone octomer, and out of the histone octomer come out, as a friend of mine calls them, kind of like ponytails, as if it were from little girls. And those tails of the histone tails have different residues that can be modified by different forms of covalent modifications, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, glucadination. And each one of those, depending on what, cytos what um, amino acid residue is modified and in which histone it's happening, will have a different consequence whether it's going to lead to gene repression or gene activation, or an enhancer activation or an enhancer repressor. Now, why is that important to us? Well, as I said before, genetic information, if all goes well in our lives, should be constant from the moment from our conception to the time of our death. And that shouldn't change no matter what happens to us. However, epigenetic change information actually does change as we age, does change as we are exposed to different environmental factors, does change as we are exposed to medication or disease or even as we develop and we grow. So all of these changes make part of normal development, and they also make part of disease. So as biologists, this is a process that we're very interested in because it can help us understand more about the different diseases that we study. We all start off as a one cellular organism. We all start off at the time of conception with one cell, which then subsequently divides into you know, two cells and four and eight. But then it becomes a multicellular, multi-tissue, multi-system organism. So how do we go from one genome to this level of complexity? Well, the only way we can do this, the only way we can tell this 
epithelial tissue cell that it should express certain genes and not others, as, and tell this uh, cardiac muscle cell that it should express cardiac-specific genes and not neurospecific genes. The only way we can do that is to selectively turn on and turn off genes as a response to external stimuli and transcription factors that will make sure that this happens in an organized manner. But all of this is epigenetic regulation. All of this is epigenetic differentiation and epigenetic specialization of tissues. So that's what happens normally. <clears throat> so if you're interested in normal development, epigenetic is a big, epigenetic regulation is a big part of your studies. But let's say you're not interested in normal development, you're act actually interested in any form of disease. Well, it turns out that the organism or diseases hijack this epigenetic mechanism in these different forms of disease. So we've known about cancer for many years and epigenetic deregulation, but chronic inflammation is also associated with marked changes in the epigenome. Same thing, any form of response to stress particularly chronic stress, will lead to changes in the epigenome. If you want to reprogram a cell, go from a differentiated cell to an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then further differentiate it to any tissue, all of that is going to happen through epigenetic reprogramming. So this epigenetic plasticity is involved in all the processes that we study. For many years, there have been multiple publications, and this, these are just a few examples, of how epigenetic studies have contributed to discover new forms of cancers in different forms of both solid tumors and hematopoietic malignancies. So this is an example from our work. This is an example from the TCGA showing gliomas and discovering a new subtype of uh, gliomas that was discovered solely through epigenetic studies. The same thing was true in acute leukemias where unknown, previously unknown subtypes of leukemias were only discovered when the epigenome was studied and this was not recognized when the transcription was studied. But that would be what I would call the low-hanging fruit. That would be the obvious place where people would look for epigenetic changes. Cancer was certainly the first field that really, really grew out in epigenetics. But it's not the only field. In the last 10 years, and this is just from a quick search in PubMed, you can see papers in autism, cardiac development, asthma, obesity, intrauterine growth retardation, diabetes, anything you can think of. Pretty much, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of any disease where there hasn't been a paper in epigenetics, and I, I'm really having a hard time. So if anyone knows, I would love, I would love that example. But, um, Epigenetics, as I said, is involved in many, many malignant processes. It can be a massive change, like it is in cancer, or in certain forms of cancers, or it can be a more focal change, or you may be interested in how certain developmental genes are reprogrammed as the cell differentiates. And all of those things will need specialized tests to be studied. But why is it that more people are not doing epigenetics in their own labs? Why is it we can't all just do epigenetics? Well, it turns out that many of these assays can be challenging and cumbersome to set up. They require certain knowledge of certain biochemistry or special, special equipment, special reagents. <clears throat> the other uh, thing that often happens, and the number one reason why people come knocking on my door, is that there are so many different assays. And everybody who developed an epigenetic assay is convinced that their assay is the best. So everybody will try to convince you that there's the best. And it might be the best in certain conditions and not in others. But really, people are confused. They really don't know when to use what. And it's understanding because, as I said, there's a lot of out there. Also, the reagents are very expensive sometimes. So if you just want to do you know, an N of three compared to three in your developmental study, and you need to buy reagents for 48 reactions, it becomes very expensive. Sometimes the experimental design can be complicated, either designing specialized primers that require a lot of time and spe specific software or specific knowledge, or you need to know specific things about the biology, for example, whether hydroxymethylation is important or not in your tissue when you're studying cytosine methylation, things like that that we're gonna to touch upon later. But all of those things, 
interfere and make assay design complicated, and you really need to have a certain degree of um, knowledge before you can actually embark on doing these assays. And finally, if the data analysis, even for the most standard single, low si uh, single locus studies, they're not that standard. These are not gene expression studies where you can just take any pull-down menu <clears throat> tool that's on the web or even, even ChIP-seq studies sometimes are easier to study than cytosine methylation studies. So um, none of these are trivial and it requires either special software or special knowledge to be able to um, perform it. But what we hope, and I think that what we, uh, the idea behind setting up the epigenomics core was that this shouldn't be the reason why you don't do these things. There are people here, myself and others, who have been doing epigenetics for many years and we hope we can help you so that if within the big question of whatever your biological question is in your lab, you have a specific epigenetic interest, you don't have to fight the uphill battle of setting up all these assays and becoming an expert and buying all these expensive re reagents, but we are here to help you. <clears throat> so how can we help you? What are the aims of our core? Well, number one, we're here to provide consultation services to help you even decide if this is feasible for you. If you are asking the right question, am I looking at the right mark based on the biological question I have? Can I even do these assays in my system? All of those things, we are here to help you, to help you design those primers that are difficult. We also provide next generation sequencing uh, services to do either histone modifications or uh, the protein readers and writers of the epigenome or cytosine modifications, all of those things, which again, may be challenging to set up in your lab or may be expensive for each investigator to set up all the reagents in their lab, so we are there to help with that. We also provide access to these state-of-the-art uh, single locus assays for DNA methylation, that uh, go beyond your simple uh, methylation sensitive PCR that most labs have been able to set up or your simple bisulfite sequencing. These are um, highly quantitative but cumbersome to, to design, but we're there to help you. And finally, we're go we will, are going to offer you any bioinformatics support you may need or want. You can choose to take the data as raw as you like it after we've decided that it passed quality control, or you can take a fully analyzed cohort. Whatever your choice is, we offer those services and they're there for you to, to make, uh, take advantage of. So who are we? Well, uh, that's uh, uh, obviously me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the advantage of having a husband who's a photographer, so that's the one official picture that I have and I share with everyone. Uh, <laughs> Maureen Sarter, she is the uh, faculty level bioinformatics director. As I said, we, when we envisioned and we had all those meetings with the leadership at the university, we recognized that epigenomics has a major hurdle in data analysis. And we wanted to offer you a full service core where you wouldn't have to have to deal with that data yourself if you didn't want to. So the, the, only th the only way we envisioned this happening was if we had both a uh, scientific director and myself and a bioinformatics director at a faculty level who has expertise in assay development for these rare assays. So even if we come up with, or if you come up with something new and rare you wanna do, we're there to help you design the tools to analyze it as well. Um, once uh, Maureen accepted the challenge to show, join me in this, we recruited uh, Ana Rodriguez from uh, the bioinformatics core, who also has experience in epigenomics analysis and who, was, who decided to uh, join us in the EpiCore. And then we recruited an external uh, PhD level, Dr. Claudia Lalancet, who's sitting over there, and who is our everyday manager and epigenomics expert in the core. And she's also there to answer, uh, not just process your samples, but answer any questions and also help, uh, uh, help with consultation and guidance. So these are the uh, faces for now. 
We already project based on the demand that we've had just in the last three months that we will be needing to expand on this personnel because we already have a um, queue of more close to 100 samples now. So, a little recapping what I've been saying before. How will this core benefit U of M investigators? Well, it'll give you access to experiments that may otherwise be restricted to small sp groups of specialized people who had the expertise. Um, we're always happy, and this is, this is a, a side comment, uh, we are obviously a teaching university, and we recognize that students may want to learn some of these things, so we're always happy to help you if you want to set up things in your lab, we can do that as well. But we do offer the service full in the core. This obviously also brings the reduced cost of sample processing. As I said, most of these kits come in reactions of 48, but most people don't do 48 reactions in their experiments. So if every lab has a waste of 40 or uh, 30 reactions, that's not good for the university or for your labs. We also offer you this integrated service where from initial consultaneous, consultation to do assay design and experimental setup, all the way to library preparation or sample processing for the single locus assay, all the way down to bioinformatics support, uh, quality control, data analysis, biological analysis, integration with other data sets. All of those things are uh, available. So going back to our cartoon, where do our assays fit, fit in this cartoon? Well, we have two ways of querying the epigenome or two levels. We can query the cytosine methylation, uh, the cytosine modifications, either in a genome-wide or a site-specific manner. Uh, we can query both cytosine methylation and hydroxymethylation. Uh, 